Hi. Can the door be closed or not? Uh, yeah, you can do what you want. Hi, everyone. We have a slightly different video for you. Instead of a boat story, we have a behind the scenes story, a making of story. I'm going to be answering a few questions about what it's like to make videos like this with a ruckus consistently going on in the background. No, but you guys have asked some really good behind the scenes questions. And so I thought I'll address them in, in today's video. One of the most common ones we get is how long does it take to edit an episode and what equipment do we use? But there's also some more sort of existential questions in there. Like, do you ever get fed up with making videos and want to live a non-public life? Or what does our family think about our lifestyle? What are some of our favorite stories to tell and what are some less favorite stories to tell? So this episode is going to be a conversational one and I'm going to take you through a few of these questions. To start, I'm going to describe how we go about making a film from start to finish. Yeah, realize you're going to get messed up. That's good. I mean, that's a good point. Like, we are the film begins with the spark of an idea. No, but normally when I begin a film, I have some idea of where I want it to go. When we're out sailing, it's pretty simple. I want to start the film in this location and stop the film when we arrive to this other location. When we're doing the refit, it's more, it's more about goals. So uh, we will stop the film. Dini. <laughs> We will stop the film when we've achieved this certain thing, or we're gonna make the film about this certain process. This is all very loose and it's in my head though, so there's no script that happens before filming. Now, over the years, I have learned when to turn the camera on and when I don't necessarily have to capture the moment. So of course, one of the most important things to film is the A roll. That's us actually talking to the camera, explaining what we're doing and giving some context behind what you're seeing. But equally important is the B roll and that's images of us showing you what we're doing. So there's usually no spoken component to the B roll. And I'm very specific with how I choose my B-roll. Immediately after taking any A-roll clip, I always take B-roll. And I take B-roll to illustrate what was just said in the A-roll. Have some things turn white. Cool. So all the things that you mentioned, you mentioned the lockers, you mentioned how this is closed. So I want to mm -hmm. get sort of close-up B-rolls of all those things that I can cut to. Sure. To illustrate your point. <clears throat> do you want to be the light, light man? Perfect. Okay, I'm going to do some wider ones from sort of out here. Get the whole picture. So if Aladino is talking about a specific tool, then I'll take some B-roll of that tool so that I can illustrate it while he's talking. So it's not just a talking headshot like this is right now. Secondly, I always make sure that we have B-roll of us actually working, actually doing the thing that we're describing in the A-roll. This is a little bit more difficult because very often we'll both be working. And so then I have to stop and pick up the camera. Another really important shot and one that's really easy to forget about are your establishing shots. So establishing shots give context to the environment you're in. So for example, an exterior shot of the boat shed or an interior shot showing the whole boat in one frame. These shots help to ground the viewer in the location. I use them frequently, especially at the start of a video to kind of let you know where we are. I also always try to film a few candid moments. These are harder to remember to film, for me anyway, because these are the moments that just happen between Aladino and I generally and I don't always think to pick up a camera for them. But I've started doing that a little bit more. I didn't film very many candid moments last season, but I am really trying to do more of that now because I think that helps the viewer feel like they know us, feel like they're involved in the project, instead of it just being a more clinical, like, now we do this, now we do this, now we do this. A bit of personality and informalness is important, I think. You know what, there's really a lot of paint smell and I think I'm just gonna move locations for a second. Okay, that's much better. I'm right at the entrance to the 
boat shed now, so it's much colder, but there is a fresh breeze. So next up is equipment, video equipment. This is another commonly asked question. We've gone through a lot of different equipment over the years. We started out just with an iPhone. We eventually got an entry level camera. Now we have a really nice camera. So I'm just gonna talk about the stuff we have currently. Our main camera is a Sony a7S III. This is by no means an entry level camera. This is a really nice camera. We feel very lucky to have it. It was actually a gift from one of our patrons and it is a, it is a dream machine. I love it so much. I use a Sigma 24 to 70 millimeter f2.8 lens and I also have a Tamron 17 to 28 millimeter f2.8. I find that I use the Tamron a lot more in the boat shed because it's such a nice wide angle. But the Sigma 24 to 70 is really a good all-rounder lens for when you're out exploring a town or you're doing pretty much any other kind of work because it sort of covers all your bases. We also have a GoPro Hero 10. The GoPros are nice because they just kind of feel indestructible. You don't have to worry about them. And I find that they're really useful time-lapse cameras. That's what we use them for the most. It's just setting up a time-lapse. For audio, we have a Sony ECM B1M microphone. I don't know who's in charge of coming up with the Sony product names, but my goodness. They're, they don't particularly roll off the tongue. And then we also have two Mavic Pro drones, which at the moment in the boat shed, we're not using a lot, but when we get back out sailing, we will be using frequently. That's the main equipment. I'll talk about my computer and editing software later, but for filming, that's what we have. That's what we use. Okay, one more location change because it was way too cold sitting by the door. So now I'm inside, there's some heat going. I wanted to talk about camera settings really quick for the camera enthusiasts out there. So I shoot in shutter priority. I always need to set my shutter because when you're filming video, you can't really decide on your shutter. If your shutter speed is too low, everything will look really slow and blurry. If your shutter speed is too high, then things can also look like kind of artificially structured. And I'm always shooting in 4K 10-bit 422. I'm always filming in a log profile. So all my footage out of camera looks like a really flat image with no contrast and saturation. And then I bring that all out with color grading. Log formats help increase dynamic range so that you don't have a really blown out sky or really black, black shadows where you can't see any, anything in there. All right, moving into editing. Editing is my favorite part. If somebody else could just film all of our footage and it would just magically appear on my computer so that I could then edit it, I would be totally happy. The editing is where the magic happens. To really put the elements of storytelling into the monotony of day-to-day -day life, that's the magic. I always write a script. When I'm writing the script, I will weave the narration in with the A-roll of us talking, talking heads on the camera. Okay, now that you guys have seen the countryside, let's dive back into boat research. No, Aladino, not so fast. And to do that, I'll, I'll write out the, narr the narrative part, and then I will label all my A-roll clips and then refer to them in the script. The reason why I go to the effort to do this is because at the end I can look at my script and I can think through it very carefully. I can think through the storyline, I can think about whether all the elements work together nicely, and I can edit it really easily. I recommend it honestly, like the times that I don't use a script, I really notice it at the end. It just feels a bit more disjointed. It doesn't feel like there's any arc to the episode. Once the script is done, it's really just a matter of gluing everything together and putting it all into place. Uh, I make sure that I have establishing shots to set the scene so that we're not just jumping into a tight shot somewhere. Um, I always try to have as much b-roll as possible over all the talking head sequences because it just it makes it a bit more engaging and a bit more interesting. I choose music. This is a very fun part. So I choose music 
based on the mood of the scene. I find my music on a site called Epidemic Sound. It's kind of like a, a royalty-free sort of tool for filmmakers. You can search through their whole music catalog and all their music is available to be uploaded onto YouTube. Uh, I do pay a small subscription fee for that, but I don't find it too bad for what it is. Uh, I recently just signed up for a different royalty-free site, actually. Well, it's not technically a royalty-free site, but same idea. I can upload their music to YouTube for a subscription fee. Uh, and that one's called Musicbed. And I think their music is just a bit higher quality from what I've seen so far. So I wanted to try that out because I feel like I'm kind of scraping the bottom of epidemic sound at the moment in the genres I'm interested in. I've been using them for years and I use like five or six songs in every episode. So yeah, starting to kind of run out. Once everything's glued together, the music is in place, the voiceover is in place. Of course, I have to record the voiceover and I usually just do that with my on-camera microphone. Uh, then it's time to level all the audio to make sure nothing's too loud or too soft. And then it's time for the color grade. This is the fun part. To color grade, I use a LUT, which is basically a fancy filter for video. I use Phantom LUTs by Joel Famularo. He's a cinematographer from Australia, and I really, really like his work. I think that his LUTs are beautiful. And then I usually put a bit of Film Convert, which is a different plugin on top um, to give it a slightly more filmic effect. And then I go and make any tweaks that are necessary correct the white balance, correct exposure here and there. And I'm getting better at this now. Um, even at the beginning of last season, I was not so good at this. So, you know, you improve over time. So that's the process really. By the time that's all done, the video can be exported and uploaded to YouTube and shared with you all. Let's get into some of the questions that you asked and we'll really get into the behind the scenes of Magic Carpet. So one of the first questions was how long does it take to edit an episode? It takes me, if I'm really focused, I can get it done in like a long day, like a 12 hour day. But let's be totally honest, I'm not always that focused. And so it generally takes me two days. The next question is how did I get started as a YouTuber? And what changes have I made to my kit and workflow over time? YouTube for me really started as a creative outlet, to have an outlet for my writing, for my music. I didn't know a lot about filmmaking, which will be apparent if you watch the first few episodes we uploaded. But yeah, I love editing these videos. I'm happy I get to do it. The next part of that question was, what changes have I made to my kit and workflow over time? Everything. I mean, we started out with just an iPhone and we had a GoPro 5. After the first year, we bought an entry-level camera. We bought a Canon M50, and that served us well for a long time. Uh, we did the second season of the Mediterranean, the entire North Through the Continent series, and the Netherlands series just with that Canon M50. And, and of course, now we have the really nice equipment, which is super exciting. Equipment does make a difference, of course. If it didn't make a difference, there would be no point in upgrading. Uh, but it is certainly not the most important thing. The story and how you present yourselves is 100% the most important thing. In terms of changes to my workflow, that's also changed drastically. I mean, to begin with, <laughs> to begin with, I don't know if I've ever mentioned this on the channel. I had a 2010 MacBook and it just couldn't edit video. It just, it was terrible. And I actually couldn't watch any of our videos on it. It was too slow to play them back in real time. So it would play the audio back in real time, but not the video. It would be like super jerky, like one frame a second. So I could never tell if our video was stabilized. I could never tell if our transitions were smooth. I couldn't really like, I, yeah, I couldn't watch the video. So I edited according to audio. And then when I paused, the video, I could, I mean, I could see what was on the screen. Like I knew which clips were where, but I just, I didn't know any more than that. So then by the time I had exported it and uploaded it to YouTube, then I could watch it on my phone and then I could see the whole thing. But by that point I was like, I'm not going back to change it. That was so much work already. It's already uploaded to YouTube. Like we're done here. So yeah, a lot of our early videos, weird transitions and shaky footage. That's just how it was. 
Oh, speaking of my computer, actually, I forgot to mention this. I do have a new computer that I just bought in December. It has been a game changer. I have one of the M1 Pros, not the M1 Max, but an M1 Pro, and it's been incredible. I can edit so smoothly. It saved me so much time because it just plays the videos. It doesn't hiccup. It doesn't, it's, it's not concerned about anything. It just does what I ask it to do. And that is phenomenal. Oh, and for editing software, I forgot to mention that as well. I use Final Cut, but I mean, it's really not important. I, there's three big players. There's Final Cut, there's Premiere Pro, and there's DaVinci Resolve. Any of those will be completely adequate. They do more or less the same things. So uh, the editing program, not important. I mean, you can even start with iMovie if you want. It's free, it's easy, it's simplified, and it'll do pretty much everything you'll want to do at the beginning. The next question, do you ever get fed up with making videos and just want to live a non-public life? This is an interesting question. I never get fed up with making videos. I really, truly love making videos. In terms of the public life thing, I mean, yeah, sometimes I have felt uneasy about it. It's taken some time to sort of get used to it and figure out what balance works for us. I think where we're at now is that I actually don't feel like we share our whole lives on YouTube. We share our boat lives on YouTube, but we don't share too much outside of that. And that was a conscious choice. I mean, I experienced this where it starts to creep into every moment of your life. And instead of living a normal human experience, every moment that you live, you start to think, can this be content? Can this be filmed? So having a clear idea, I do film this, I don't film this. And, and sticking to that, I think is vital. Next question. What does our family think of our lifestyle? Both our families are super supportive. Dini and I both grew up with pretty uh, adventurous and out of the box sort of parents. We are very lucky with our parents. Next question. What are my favorite stories to tell and which ones are more challenging or less fun? I think travel stories are my favorite to tell. I'm so excited to start telling more. In a way, they almost write themselves just because it's already such an interesting premise, traveling in general, seeing new places. Uh, in terms of challenges, I think that probably the Refit series has been the most challenging for me to edit because the story is not always immediately apparent. A lot of what we do is pretty repetitive, sanding, scraping, varnishing, painting, whatever. So bringing a sense of intrigue and excitement to that has been more of a challenge, but in a good way. I mean, it, it's good to push yourself as a storyteller and not just, yeah, tell stories that basically have already written themselves. Next question. How do you find the energy to do these videos every week? Well, first of all, I do enjoy them. It's fun. So that helps. But more importantly, at this point, it is also now our job. And so having that sort of external discipline is honestly really helpful, especially for more artistic kind of folks, which I definitely identify as. I think we can spend a lot of time waiting for inspiration to strike. And when you've got a deadline every single week, you don't have the luxury of waiting for inspiration to strike. You've got to get something done and published. And that external motivation has actually, I think, pushed my skills as a storyteller way beyond what they ever were before. Because I have to really structure my thoughts and think more deeply about how I tell a story beyond just like this ephemeral creative spark that somehow gets slodged in my brain, right? Like I have to come up with processes for it, like the script writing and like thinking about your establishing shots, your B-roll, your A-roll. It's been really helpful. And most interestingly, some of the episodes that I'm most proud of came out of a feeling of writer's block or creative block uh, when I sat down and I had to really think through the process. This next question is a very, very flattering one. So thank you very much. Uh, but somebody asked, I can't believe that you are doing this by yourself every week. So could you please introduce us to your team and how many people are on it? We do not have a team. We really don't. It really is just Aladino and I. Um, I mean, maybe in the future, it might be nice to have some help in certain areas. It really is getting to be a lot. I'm not going to lie to you. Like it is, 
sometimes overwhelming, I think especially during refit time because I am very torn between wanting to spend all my time in the shed helping Aladino to get this refit moving forward and also knowing that I need to spend a lot of time inside on the computer uh, doing this creative work and you know still putting a lot of effort into our videos because that is our bread and butter. And then when you add emails and correspondence on top of that, it does get to be a lot. So maybe in the future we will look for someone to help us with certain stages of the puzzle, but yeah, I don't even know how to go about hiring or, or like like what parts I would even need help with because it feel they all feel so personal to us. Like who who else could how could I train someone to jump in to all these very specific things we've set up? I don't know. That's a whole other topic. Second to last question, how many hours of video get pared down to make a 20 minute episode? Usually about two to four hours of video. And last question is, how do I make the multiple Maya videos? Uh, these are the videos where I'm usually playing music and there's multiples of me on the same screen. Um, I was considering whether I'm gonna answer it and I don't think I'm going to. I think, I think it's a fun secret. It's a fun effect. If you know anything about video editing, then I'm sure you know how I do it. It's, it's, pretty, it's not rocket science. It's not some crazy mystery, but, but yeah, I think I'm gonna save that one. And it's fun when you guys guess what the process is. So yeah, maybe, maybe leave it in the comments. How do you think the multiple Maya videos are created? So thank you guys so much for watching. I hope that this has been interesting and sort of a deeper look at the behind the scenes of what we do here. So I'm gonna end it here. Thank you so much for listening to me talk for a long time. We'll see you all soon.